Welcome to the part nine of the International Christian Linguistic Colloquium, as known as IC Link. I'm Sunhun Lee from ICU. The topic of this season is African linguistics. And today we have two talks by Dr. William Bennett from Rhodes University and Dr. Christina Reader from University of Free State. Let me introduce the first speaker. Will is a senior lecturer at Rhodes University, and his research interests are on sound uh, related side of the linguistics how phonetics, phonology, and morphology, and also how sometimes syntax interact uh, with one another. He works on underrepresented and minority languages, particularly languages spoken in Africa, and he's endangered, oh no, he's not endangered. He's very interested in, <laughs> in endangered languages <laughs> and uh, language description and documentation as well. Uh, his work uh, focuses on long distance consonant interactions, uh, dissimulation and consonant harmony, and he has been documenting uh, two languages of Nigeria, Defaka and Nkoro. Uh, um, uh, they are both uh, two endangered uh, Ijoid languages. Uh, I, I think I met Will for the first time in 2007 when uh, we were both at Rutgers, and it was quite interesting uh, that year I learned a lot about uh, new things uh, about <laughs> interacting uh, between <coughs> graduate students and that was a, a really good memory and uh, it's been already 14 years I guess uh, or 15 years uh, since we've Ooh. seen and uh, our paths crossed multiple times and like we worked on uh, some work together in the previous years as well so it's good uh, uh, to have you here at ICU Link. Uh, today, Will will talk about the typology of click sounds, lessons from marginal click inventories. Please go ahead. Welcome. Thank you, Sangoon, and thank you to everyone else. It's a pleasure to uh, be here and be invited to give this talk. Uh, give me just a moment to share my screen. Oh, I cannot start screen sharing. Ah, there we go. <sighs> Okay, uh, as was previously mentioned, I'm going to talk about the typology of click sounds. And what I wanna focus on in particular in today's talk is uh, the kind of theme of what we can learn from the most marginal, most restrictive, uh, most impoverished kinds of uh, click consonant systems. So clicks are a bit strange. Um, just as sounds go, they aren't found in very many languages of the world, but then they are found in huge quantities in the few languages that do have them. But they also have some sort of anomalous characteristics that I have uh, turned up by trying to look at uh, distributions of click consonants across different languages, and also trying to look at which languages have which click sounds. So I did this survey, uh, cross-linguistic survey of clicks in as many languages as I could find. And uh, in doing so, stumbled on a couple of universal implicational relationships. Oops, sorry. Uh, the first one is, uh, concerning nasality. So one of the findings is that every language that has click sounds has nasal click sounds. And indeed there are languages that have only nasal clicks, but no languages that have clicks and lack nasalized clicks. So if a language has any clicks at all, it has nasal clicks. There's also a, uh, an implication about position. So if a language allows clicks in the middle of a word, like in a word medial onset, then it also allows clicks at a word initial or stem initial uh, position. So if clicks can be in the middle of uh, morpheme, then they can also be at the beginning. Um, and there seems to be an implication or an implicational scale or hierarchy among different types of clicks. Um, so languages with bilabial clicks are few and far between. They're kind of vanishingly rare. Uh, every language we know of that has bilabial clicks also has several other types of clicks, four other types at least, um, including palatal, uh, lateral, dental, and alveolar. Uh, and you tend to find this kind of scale whereby if a language has uh, any one of those types, you know, if it has palatals, then it also has the ones that are sort of further down on the scale. So the, the overall sense looking across different languages at how clicks are distributed is that there are these kinds of uh, 
implicational regularities. Okay, I am going to uh, start by focusing on the one related to nasality. Uh, and as I said earlier, uh, oral clicks imply nasal clicks. That's the, the um, gist of the generalization. What does that mean? Well, okay, it means if a language has any clicks, it has nasal clicks, not vice versa. And the reason I think that's interesting is because usually it goes the other way around. So if you look at non-click sounds, uh, you tend to see, if anything, an effect towards uh, nasal sounds implying oral ones. So you see this with vowels, for instance, there are lots of uh, languages that have both nasal and oral vowels. We don't know of any languages that have like only nasal vowels. So usually it seems like if a language has a, a nasalized version of a vowel, it also has an oral vowel. Um, there are also languages that are known to lack contrastive nasal consonants, uh, but we don't know of any languages that lack oral consonants. Um, there are languages that have nasalized continuance or nasalized sonorants. These are quite rare, but every language that I was able to find that has one of these also has the corresponding oral counterpart. So it's like if you have a nasalized version of an L, well, then you also have an L. Um, and there's also patterns about uh, places of articulation. So putting all of these observations together, it kind of looks like there's a sort of generalizable implication that uh, if you could have the nasal version of a sound, you should also be able to have the oral version, the non-nasal one. Uh, but then with clicks, we see the opposite. So the question is, well, why should those be the reverse of what we are used to and what we expect? Uh, the hypothesis that I have proposed to explain this is that really it's not about nasality, it's about airstream. Um, and indeed, lots of languages use clicks not as consonants, but just sort of as sounds in isolation. And those tend not to be audibly nasal, which suggests that the uh, impetus for having this kind of nasality on clicks, for treating a uh, nasality as sort of the default version of a click, uh, probably has to do with unifying clicks and non-click segments together in the same word, in the same sequence, right? If you're going to make only clicks by themselves, uh, there's no pressure for them to be nasalized. The pressure to nasalize them seems to come from wanting to have the vowel following them. Uh, so that's one characteristic of uh, clicks that su suggests that like putting them together with normal pulmonic sounds is weird. And that seems to fit neatly with them also having their own special airstream mechanism where a click is produced by using suction. Um, so the hypothesis is that venting of airflow through the nasal cavity is what produces the nasality of a nasal click. And that this is actually just the means of keeping pulmonic airflow going during a click. Uh, I'll go into that in a bit more detail later, but that's the gist of it. So why are nasal clicks funny? Well, because they're not really nasal, because they are actually pulmonic clicks. So um, I'm not going to focus in depth on all of these, but I wanted to lay out the, the general notion for context. Um, so the formal proposal that uh, I will make is that there are these two phonological airstream features. One I've called plus minus lingual, and that's related to the, the lingual suction mechanism, the clickiness of a click. And the other one is plus minus pulmonic, which is intended to represent pulmonic airflow, normal speech sort of airflow, uh, exhalation driven from the lungs. So uh, we have those two features. And the crucial assumption I'm going to argue for is that nasal clicks are plus pulmonic clicks. So the gist of that argument is that the mechanism involved in making a click forces the only forces it uh, dictates that the only way the vocal tract can also do pulmonic airflow at the same time is by having it be vented through the nasal cavity, which makes it sound nasal. So if we represent nasality or the nasality of nasal clicks as uh, 
this feature pulmonic rather than nasal, then it turns out we can come up with a nice explanation for some of these uh, typological patterns, especially the implicational universals. So we can explain the, um, the implication between oral clicks and nasal clicks uh, as an implication between non-pulmonic sounds and pulmonic ones. Okay, um, the structure of the talk. So I'm gonna uh, tell you a little bit about the typology first. And then I'll go into a little bit more detail about this representational scheme and the airstream features that uh, I just mentioned. Um, and then we'll revisit briefly how that kind of shapes the typology. And uh, towards the end, I'm going to touch on in more detail uh, the sort of the role of key or the role of uh, more uh restricted or more marginal types of click consonant systems as actually being important data points for mapping out this empirical landscape okay so let's start with the typology um what i did is this cross linguistic survey that i mentioned earlier uh i have uh called the number about 50 languages because it's sort of difficult to nail down uh, an exact number of lets. There are some cases where like we have a word list from 1922 that's of one dialect and we have a different word list by a different author collected from different people in a different place. And maybe they're the same language, maybe they're not, maybe they're two varieties of the same dialect family, uh, or maybe they're you know, much more closely related than that. Often our picture is a little bit murky just because of the uh, lack of literature out there. So I've tried to count conservatively. Um, I will mention that the amount that we know about each individual language sort of varies. Like there are some languages that have had detailed uh, articulatory or acoustic or aerodynamic studies on them. Uh, and then there are other languages that, you know, we know from a word list. Uh, so we have to make some inferences there. Uh, one of the things that makes this especially thorny as an issue is that a lot of Khoisan languages, which are the ones that tend to have the most clicks, uh, tend to have very similar names that are very similar in shape and very easy to confuse. So for example, the language Ta is another, is, is the name of a language that is also called uh, which may be spelled in one of two ways, either as uh, X O O N with an exclamation before it, or uh, with a nasality mark on the last O rather than an N. This is a completely different language than the very similarly spelled who. In fact, it's uh, from a completely unrelated language family. Uh, so ta and hun and hon are all the same language. And they are different from hun, which is itself the same as hun and hun and hun, various spellings uh, preferred by various authors. Um, and this is especially tricky because uh, hun is like, you know, a very small language. There maybe are two dialects, but not very many speakers. Whereas the other one, hun, is a, a, a family of dozens to, yeah, probably dozens is where we want to cap that, uh, dozens of dialects that actually are quite different from one another in, in some respects. Um, so that's part of why the number of languages has a bit of uncertainty factored into it. Uh, yeah, so, okay, uh, where are these typological observations from? They're from this cross-linguistic survey of basically all the languages I could get my hands on data for. Um, and in, Interpreting this data, I have tried to cast a wide net for how I am interpreting nasality. So any mention of anything that involves the morpheme nasal, whether it's pre-nasalized or post-nasalized or nasalized or nasal or uh, partially nasalized, I've counted all of those as being uh, nasal for purposes of this study. Uh, and you know, the thinking is that those are then finer grained distinctions that could be made once we have an understanding of the basic picture of the oral versus nasal. Okay, so here is a uh, graph of what the sort of two axes of the typology look like. So we have lots of languages that have basically no clicks at all. So these are languages like English, 
Spanish, Turkish, I suspect Japanese is probably in there. Um, and, you know, for our purposes, we can think of these as languages that prohibit clicks in the phonology. That doesn't mean that people never produce them. Like I know there are studies that show that in English, uh, monolingual English speakers will regularly use clicks as like a turn taking uh, indicator in conversation, right? So if you are having trouble thinking of a word, you might go, what is that? Oh yeah. So people have been producing these sounds naturalistically, uh, but they don't seem to be part of the phonological system. All right, so there are languages without clicks, and then there are languages with clicks. Um, the most common uh, group of languages to use clicks are the Khoisan languages, which happen to have a lot of prosodic characteristics in common, one of which is that they tend to have two syllable words with lots of different consonants allowed in the first syllable and not much allowed in the second syllable. So in all of those languages, you find this pattern where clicks are allowed as the first consonant in a stem or a root, but they aren't allowed in the second syllable of a root. Um, and then finally, you get languages that allow clicks in onsets. Generally, I don't know of any languages that allow clicks in any coda position. It's a little bit hard to know how seriously to take that, given that a lot of these languages also don't allow other consonants in coda position. So I'm not really uh, focusing on codas, but that would presumably be the next branch of the scale off the screen to the right. Um, okay, so that's one axis is this kind of where are clicks allowed? Are they completely pro prohibited? Are they allowed only in one position? Are they allowed in onset position? So in more than one position uh, or yeah. And then the other axis of this typology is uh, where clicks are allowed to be nasal versus oral. So this is the up down access. Um, if you look at some languages, you find that all of the clicks in them are nasal. So this is the case in Damon and Chinese and Digo and maybe South African English and or Afrikaans and perhaps Kenya Rwanda. Um, some of these examples are marginal. I'll come back to that later. Uh, so there are some languages that are sort of like the most restrictive kind of click system you can have is a language where the only click that's allowed in the phonology is if it's a nasal click and it's at the start of a morphine. And that's the pattern you find in Digo and in Dem. Uh, and then further to the right, uh, there are languages that have this uh, nasal and oral um, contrast uh, either in some positions or everywhere. So what you find looking down the right column of this table is uh, there are lots of languages that like just have oral clicks and they have nasal clicks and they are contrastive and you need to know the difference. You know, there are minimal pairs and everything. So Hadza is one of those languages, Tosa and Zulu and Debele are like that, Fue is probably like that, um, and you know, other languages too. Then there are some languages that have a pattern where there are both nasal and oral clicks. And you can make a distinction between a nasal click and an oral click at the start of a morpheme, but where clicks in the middle of a morpheme are always nasalized. So we find this in Sandawe and uh, based on looking at dictionaries, I think it might also be the case in Kliriku and Kwangali. Uh, Sandawe is the one that we have good uh, aerodynamic studies available from previous work. Um, and then finally, the sort of more restrictive on the nasal oral axis is languages that require clicks to be nasal. So where nasal clicks are allowed, oral clicks are not. And the hollow is a language like that. Um, possibly uh, certain varieties of Afrikaans and or South African English might fall into that bucket as well. Uh, I'll come back to that. Later. All right. So this is kind of the the snapshot of the typology that we're trying to capture, right? If we have a theory that produces these different types of languages, well, then we might think that that theory is sort of correct. Is, so think of this as the, the target that we are aiming to capture with our analysis. Um, I've talked through some of this before, uh, but the thing I wanna focus on here is the gaps, right? So 
We find languages that have only nasal clicks. We do not find the opposite of that. Languages where there are no nasal clicks and only non-nasal clicks, only oral clicks. Um, we also don't find any languages where nasal clicks or where where yes where nasal clicks are more restricted than oral clicks so this would be like the reverse of the pattern that i alluded to in sundawe where like imagine if uh you can have nasal and oral clicks and you could have both of them in the middle of a word but then at the beginning of a word you can only have oral clicks that's not something that is attested okay so uh we have the snapshot of the typology and it seems like there are some notable gaps, things that are conceptually possible, but not found in any natural language. So one of the things we want our theory to do is to produce these types of languages. One of the other things we want it to do is to not produce the types of languages that aren't found. Okay. Um, I'm happy to be interrupted with questions, by the way. I don't mind one way or the other. Um, feel free to chime in if there are anything. Uh, yeah. Okay, so we've covered the typological picture. Um, now let's look at the representation, the phonological representation that I'm uh, trying to argue for. So um, I want to start that by just doing a brief review of how clicks are produced, because I know this is not necessarily uh, fresh in everyone's brain all the time. Um, so clicks involve three phases. The first phase we could call the closure phase. Um, these diagrams are taken from a paper by Doggle and Mayer. Um, so I've adopted their names. Uh, I don't think the names are especially crucial, but basically the first step is, well, if you're gonna make a click, you need to make a closure. In fact, you need to make two closures. Why two? Well, the key second step of making a click is to create suction. So first, what you need to do is have like a closure which might be formed by the dorsum at the velum or at the uvula you know somewhere in the back of the mouth you make a closure and then somewhere else in the front of the mouth with a different part of the tongue or else with the lips you make a second closure and when you make those two closures what that does is it traps a little pocket of air in between and once that little pocket of air that cavity is established then you can uh, do gestures to increase the size of the cavity, which will lower the pressure and create suction. So this is like, you know, you have the tongue, you establish a, a dental constriction and a velar constriction, and then you lower the tongue body and it kind of pulls, uh, creates suction on the, the air that's trapped between those two constrictions. And that then creates a very loud burst when you eventually release the uh, closures. Um, generally, the front closure is the one that's released first, and generally that's the one where the more interesting stuff happens. Um, but there are some languages that have some types of clicks that involve, say, frication or uh, ejection with the release of the back closure, or ones where the back closure just needs to have like an audible burst in some case and not necessarily a close. But these are the three key steps. So to make a click, you have to make closures, you have to create suction between them, and then you have to do the release with the burst. All right, so given that, let's think through some of the aerodynamic consequences. Well, if you need to have two closures in order to do lingual suction, it follows that you cannot have air flowing through the oral cavity at the same time, right? If, the, if you have two uh, closures in the oral cavity, uh, you know, like one at the back and one at the front, well, then no air can get through the mouth. So that means that if you are doing the suction-y part of a click and you are exhaling at the same time, the only place that air can get out is through the nose. So if you uh, lower the velum, that air can escape, that's venting. Uh, if you raise the velum, then what you've done is essentially seal off the entire vocal tract. And then if you have continued airflow out of the lungs, all that's going to do is raise the air pressure in the pharynx. Uh, sorry, just one sec. I've lost my cursor somehow. Uh, okay, there we go. Uh, okay, so uh, 
what you can see in this diagram on the right is this trade-off. So on the left, there's an oral click. On the right, there's a nasal click. And what we're seeing from the aerodynamic measurements here is that really the choice of nasality corresponds to the choice of uh, whether you raise pharyngeal pressure or vent that extra pressure through the nose is creating nasal airflow. So the click on the right has lots of nasal airflow, no pharyngeal pressure. The click on the left has no nasal airflow. That means it has to have uh, pharyngeal pressure built up. Okay, so if you're doing a click and you wanna continue the airflow, it's gotta go through the nose. And if we pair that with the observation that one of the closures in a click is generally at the back of the mouth, then what we've done is establish basically a way to accidentally make an mm, right? So if you're going to make a click and you want to have nasal airflow, what that's going to do is sound like you're producing like a velar nasal or a uvular nasal at the same time. All right. Um, so I'm going to skip over some of the phonetic details in the interest of time, but basically the idea is this trade-off between pharyngeal pressure and nasal flow is what these aerodynamic features refer to. So um, in order to have a uh, lingual sound, you need this kind of suction, as we mentioned, that's like a negative pressure. Um, and if you don't have that negative pressure, then you don't have a click, right? You have a, a non-lingual suction sound. Uh, and the uh, sort of on the other hand side of that is uh, the way that the pulmonic feature is defined is if you do have increased pressure, abnormal pressure in the pharyngeal cavity, well, that's, you have then stopped pulmonic airflow and you are minus pulmonic. Whereas if you uh, do not have a pressure buildup there and you just keep the air smoothly flowing, uh, then you have a plus pulmonic step. So the key notion is this last bullet point here. That's the one you need to remember. Um, that plus lingual plus pulmonic gives you something that sounds nasal. All right. So what that does is give us this kind of four-way categorization of all the sounds. We've got the non-clicks, which are, you know, puh and buh and th and ah and so forth. Uh, and those are minus lingual plus pulmonic in this analysis. Uh, then you have oral clicks, which are plus lingual minus pulmonic. Then you have nasal clicks, which are plus lingual plus pulmonic and have that nasality because of the pulmonic airflow. And I'm presuming that having minus lingual minus pulmonic is just fundamentally impossible because that gives you a sound that has no airstream at all. Like it's sort of uh, not well formed. Okay, so the, these three representational categories are, are the, the key ones that we need to distinguish between. All right, once we do that representationally, then we can establish a fairly simple set of constraints that will capture the typology fairly elegantly. Um, so I've worked this out using um, a system defined in the, the way that's spelled out here. Uh, I don't wanna get into the details too much. So I'm gonna kind of give you the, the gist of what goes in and then jump straight to the output. And we can talk in the question period about uh, questions about the constraints. This is not intended to be an OT-centric talk. So the, the gist of the idea is we want to consider clicks in stem initial position because we know some languages do that and you know allow that, but don't allow clicks elsewhere. And then we also want to allow the possibility that the language would allow clicks elsewhere. So there's kind of two cases, two locations of a click that we need to think about. Um, and that's sort of uh, initial and non-initial. And then per the representational framework, there's these three segment types that we need to attend to, um, which I have abbreviated as uh, C for the non-clicks, C for consonant, but I mean the non-click consonants, uh, then uh, N exclamation mark for nasal click and plain exclamation mark for oral click. So what I did is I put together a system that just tries out every possibility of these. So 
the set of inputs that are considered in the, the OT portion of the analysis are, you know, all of these three different types of sounds in all of these different positions and also every combination of them. Uh, so, you know, a nasal click at the beginning and a non-nasal click later or vice versa. All right. Um, these are the constraints uh, that are part of this analysis. There are two markedness constraints that say, uh, basically, number one, don't have clicks. That's going to do the work of restricting clicks generally. And number two is this constraint that I've been calling agree pulmonic. And I've framed it as an agree constraint uh, in sort of a nod to this intuition that the, the impetus for nasality in clicks is tied to having the click together with a non-click in the same syllable or in the same string of sounds being uttered. So anytime you have a click followed by a vowel, well, the vowel is going to be pulmonic because it's a normal speech sound. That's just how it is. Uh, so if you have a click together with a vowel, that creates a disagreement for this pulmonic feature. This constraint wants there to be agreement, which I guess could be obtained either by um, doing something strange to the vowel so that it's non-pulmonic, or more likely by making the click nasal, making it pulmonic. So we've got these two markedness constraints, one against clicks, and then one more specifically against oral clicks. And then two faithfulness constraints that preserve the underlying uh, airstream values uh, in different positions. So I've got one that's for the stem initial position and one that's for onsets generally. Uh, now, both of these constraints uh, sort of set up a, a stringency kind of relationship, right? The um, everything that violates agree pulmonic also violates no click in, in the, at least in the type, the space of segments I'm considering. Uh, so the uh, agree pulmonic is kind of a more specialized case of the no click constraint, right? They, that's the, the type of relationship between them. Um, and you find the same type of relationship between the faithfulness constraints as well, right? Uh, the stem initial position is a type of onset position. So if you uh, have a uh, candidate that violates faithfulness in the uh, initial position, then it must also violate faithfulness in the onset position. Yes, okay. Uh, so, like, one of the cool things about stringency is people have been working on stringency not related to clicks, but in other aspects of optimality theory. So this is fairly well understood. Once we have these constraints, like this set of constraints, uh, the, the analysis sort of does itself. Like it has the same form, the same general structure as other analyses of other phenomena. So what we get as a result are uh, one, two, three, four, five, six types of languages. I've represented them here using what's called a typohedron. So what this represents is I have basically named each language in the typology according to the clickiest word that it allows. So um, this language that's called CVCV, that's a, one of the languages that does not allow clicks at all. Uh, this one below it that's called uh, ClickVCV, that one allows oral clicks and nasal clicks in the initial position, but it doesn't allow any kind of clicks in the medial position. So if you look at the kind of the triangle that's on the left face of this abstract geometrical shape, what you see is three different languages that all of them allow uh, no clicks in the medial position. They only allow clicks initially, if that. And then what they do is they kind of cycle through the three possibilities of, do you allow just nasal clicks or nasal and oral or no clicks whatsoever? So that we have kind of those three possibilities. And then on the other end of this figure, uh, in a different region of the typology, we get the set of languages that allow clicks in medial positions. And then those can also make a three-way choice of you know, what kind of clicks are allowed where. They can allow the pulmonic, allow the non-pulmonic ones to show up 
in any onset, and that's the uh, click v, click v one. Uh, or they can allow any click initially, but require clicks to be nasal immediately. That's the um, click v and click v. Or they can require all clicks to be nasal all the time, and then you get the bottom right one. So um, this is a, a sort of abstract representation of the set of languages that we get out of the uh, theoretical pieces defined so far. Okay, um, I'm gonna skip over the formal OT analysis uh, and jump back to basically this uh, slide, which will analyze kind of the structure of it. So, what are the choices involved? Like, what you know, if you if you're a random language in the space of uh, this typology, uh, how what what things could you do? And what we end up with is sort of a, a list of four choices. So we get the languages that allow medial clicks and the ones that don't. And that kind of splits the, the space of languages in half. That gives us all the three on the right and the three on the left. Um, a second choice is within that, are clicks allowed to be uh, in initial position? And if the answer is no, then you're trapped in this CVCV corner of the typological space. And if the answer is yes, initial clicks are allowed, then you'll be in one of the bottom two on the left. Uh, there's a third choice that separates the, the most clicky language from the other two. Um, and that corresponds to the ranking of the agree pulmonic constraint relative to um, faithfulness in the onset position. Uh, and the sort of the trait that comes out of that choice of constraint ranking is uh, whether uh, non-nasal clicks are allowed immediately. Uh, and then the fourth uh, partition here is whether uh, clicks are required to be nasal in initial positions. So this amounts to the choice of how agree pulmonic is ranked with respect to uh, ident initial airstream. Um, so uh, the ranking between that faithfulness in initial position constraint and the reposition constraint. Okay, um, I realize that I've blazed through that far faster than is appropriate to make it actually understandable. The key thing I want you to take away is just that we can understand this typology uh, in terms of individual choices about how the constraints are ranked, right? So we've got these sort of four different choices. Each one is about the ranking of a pair of constraints. And we put together those four choices and we get the whole picture of the typology. So um, we understand its internal structure. It is made up of these four choices. Each of which then boils down to two constraints ranked relative to one another. Um, now, what's cool is these six languages in the typology happen to be exactly the same six that we uh, were shooting for before. So let me jump all the way back. Uh, these ones, right? The language with no clicks, the language with stem initial uh, clicks, the language with only stem initial nasal clicks, and so forth. So the six uh, slots that we kind of see as natural languages are six that are the six that are found in this typological system in the typology predicted by the theory uh which suggests that maybe the theory is on the right track uh and also notably the types of gaps that we find like the languages that aren't attested aren't in this typology it does not predict the types of systems that are not attested Okay, um, so if we make this representational assumption that clicks are that nasal clicks are pulmonic, then we get an analysis that can explain the typology, which is cool. Like business as usual, we we have found a problem, we have solved it. Good. Um, what I'll do briefly is compare that to, uh, actually, no, I'm going to skip the nasality section in the interest of time, um, just because I want to leave time for questions. Um, 
And I want to jump straight to the kind of end result of that. So um, basically, why should we use pulmonic instead of nasal? Well, if we use nasality as a second feature instead of this pulmonic feature, and we assume the normal things that nasality can do, then we don't get the same typology. We instead get a typology that also includes the types of languages that are not attested. So like languages that denasalize clicks, where nasal clicks are banned, but other clicks are allowed. So if we allow our normal assumptions about how we think nasality works as a phonological feature, and we allow that to interact with the uh, representational space of possibilities that uh, we have in the other theory, we don't get the right result. So uh, we get the wrong typological predictions if we assume that nasal clicks are only ever phonologically plus nasal. We do get the right results if we assume that they are plus pulmonic instead. Okay. Um, so that's nasality. That's one of two universal scales that I mentioned. The other universal scale that I mentioned is this sort of click type or click place implication. And uh, this one is a, a little bit harder to flesh out, partly because it like it's not just two categories, nasal and oral. It's like a scale with more than two. Uh, but here's what you generally kind of see. Um, the languages that have bilabial clicks are languages like Han and uh, Pui, I think. And they also have palatal clicks and lateral clicks and dental clicks and alveolar clicks. So if you are uh, a language that has bilabial clicks, you also have all, all of those other ones. But it does not go in the other direction. So um, there are languages that have four of these types of clicks, like the palatal and the lateral and the dental and the alveolar, but that lack the bilabial ones. And those are languages like Kwe Kwe. And then you find languages that have only three kinds of clicks, and they tend to be the ones at the bottom of the hierarchy. So lateral and alveolar and dental. And that's, for instance, what you find in Klosa. Um, and then in Siswati, you find only two clicks, uh, the lateral and the dental. So again, like even the languages with the more restrictive, less permissive, uh, click systems, what they're doing is basically, it's like the, the scale populates from the bottom, right? If you have languages with only one type of click in the previous literature, uh, that type of click is always either the dental or the alveolar. So in the languages that have only one type of click and don't have any kind of place contrast for, uh, for these clicks, uh, what you find is that they are systematically dental or systematically alveolar uh, in the case of Southern Institute. All right, so we've got this kind of implicational scale. Um, it's partly confounded by some structure in the data, right? So um, lots of languages have three types of clicks because they are related to each other. The whole Nguni family of languages, for instance, that includes Zulu and Klosa and Debele. Uh, it is currently thought that Proto-Nguni borrowed three types of clicks. And so you find all of the sort of languages that belong to that family sort of have preserved this three-way distinction. Um, and then, when you find languages that have more clicks than that, what they've done is they include those three, but also more. Uh, so like the typical pattern in Kwe uh, languages or in the Ku dialect family is they've got four types of clicks, the same three that you find in the Nguni languages plus a palatal one. So there's this sense that like you sort of start with the simple ones and then build outwards. But it's a little bit hard to see because so many of the languages that have this pattern are also languages that happen to be closely related to one another. So how can we be sure that it is a thing that's an observation about phonology and not just a coincidence of history? That's kind of the question, right? Like, uh, is this 
tendency for this scale just an accident of history or uh, is this actually something that's uh, represented in the phonology of languages? And one of the uh, key things that speaks to that is these more marginal systems of clicks, right? So uh, a thing about click inventories is that they tend to be, I think the word I wanna call this is complete. So like ha is, as an example, um, it has these five different types of clicks, each of which can have further contrast, right? There are like 17 different uh, types of accompaniments. You know, clicks can be voiced, they can be nasal, they can be aspirated, they can be nasal and aspirated, they can be glottalized, they can be glottalized and voiced. Yeah, so forth. Um, so what you tend to see in lots of the languages that have more robust click systems is that they just kind of have them all. Um, so out of Paul, there's uh, this kind of, you know, think of it multiplicationally, there's five types of clicks times 17 accompaniments gives you a very large number of clicks. The only gaps in that whole space are uh, with one of the accompaniments and uh, mm -hmm. sorry, I think I may have mistyped something here. Um, the gist is that, uh, yes, so accompaniment 17 does not show up for the bilabials or the palatals, like those are unattested. It is attested only for um, the dental, the alveolar and the lateral, which um, I see I have written, I have spelled them all as uh, alveolar here. Anyway, the point of that is if we look at uh, individual click systems, we ought to be able to try to use that to see something about like how this typology, the, the implicational scale about nasality interacts with the implicational scale about place, but it's hard to see because there just isn't much data in a lot of the languages that have very robust click systems. Where there tends to be more interesting data where we can glean more insights is uh, from languages that have uh, ironically sort of much less robust or less uh, healthy systems of clicks. Um, so Ye is a, an interesting example. Ye is a language that's endangered, a minority language. Um, there's a study by Fulop and Latifoged and some third person who I've forgotten uh, at all. Uh, they surveyed 13 speakers and of those 13 speakers, they found 12 different click inventories. So as this language is being lost, what's happening is that interspeaker differences are emerging. And if we can leverage that, we could sort of use that to peer at the, the whole typology, right? If there are these kinds of interspeaker differences, well, presumably each speaker has a consistent grammar represented in their head. Uh, and therefore we can, if, we're, if we have sufficiently individuated data, we could try to look at those. Uh, and what I brought as sort of proof of concept for that is uh, an example from, uh, I hesitate to call it a language, but from what we'll call Gonakwa. So what is Gonakwa? Um, Gonakwa is what I have decided to call this data that I collected from uh, this lady, uh, Jean Burgess. Uh, she is, to her knowledge, the only surviving Gonakwa person who has like provable ancestry. And so she has sort of adopted the title of chief until someone else can prove that they are more eligible for that title. Anyway, I'll let her introduce herself. So Gonakwa is a name that we know from uh, it being recorded like in the 1800s in the area around Gramstown where I am now. Um, the language isn't really spoken, but what you do find are sort of a handful of lexical items that have survived in some cases. So Chief Jean uh, says that she speaks English and Afrikaans uh, and a little bit of Tosa, 
but not much. Uh, so, you know, functionally, she does not speak any Nama or Kwekwe or like any of these other languages that have more robust click systems. And her class is not very good. So it's unlikely that that is like where she's getting her knowledge of other things. Okay. So ostensibly, you know, she does not speak any of the language of clicks, except she did have a grandparent who did have fluent knowledge and she learned some words from, from this person. So what's cool about this case is uh, we can see kind of a footprint of this language that used to be wi more widely spoken. Uh, and we can use that to kind of peer at how the phonology behaves in cases where the language has sort of contracted. So what's interesting that you find with this is um, we don't have any descriptions of Gonakwa, but we presume that it's uh, you know, for from uh, on the grounds of history and sociology, uh, we presume that it's one of the many dialects of Southern Cape Kwekwe. Um, and the uh, Namibian varieties are still, you know, widely spoken and well studied and so forth. So uh, here's the click inventory of Namibian Kwekwe. We think Gonakwa is sort of a cousin of that, right? We would presume it would have the same click inventory. Um, perhaps with some minor details of the slight phonetic differences or so forth. So this is like the, the presumed putative click system of the language that uh, Chief Jean's grandmother would have spoken. When Jean produces words with clicks though, she does not use all these clicks. She only uses four of them. Uh, so out of the 16 clicks found in uh, sort of Kwekwe uh, dialects generally, uh, her personal click system, her personal click phonology, it, her, her idiolect, seems to have contracted that into just four clicks. And the four that uh, she produces are dental and alveolar, so uh, and uh, um, and then nasal counterparts of both of those, so nga and nga. Uh, so why those four clicks? That got me wondering. And I think this is something that follows from the analysis that's, that's sort of the line of analysis that's uh, been proposed and is further being developed. Uh, so we know that like clicks can be lost generally. Uh, this particular individual's case sort of points to a, a concrete situation where there aren't any real like contrasts. Like there's no, no words that need to be distinguished functionally on the basis of how these clicks are produced. So there's not really much functional load. And what's happened is that the, the system, you know, where presumably uh, Chief Jean's grandmother had 16 clicks and she only has four, what's happened is that they've contracted to the, the uh, uh, more permissive end of the, the, the less marked end of the uh, typological scale. So even in this system that has very few clicks and only a handful of words, we still find that this nasal and oral click implication holds. So even though this is a person who has hardly any click words, uh, she still makes nasal clicks. And she even, like, I hesitate to call these contrasts, but um, she gave me this word I that means head and another word now uh, that is a type of ceremony. Um, and so that's not really a minimal pair, but it's unlikely that like the difference between I and ow would somehow affect the nasality of the click. So it really looks like she has a phonological system that just allows nasal clicks and plain clicks uh, and allows these two uh, places as well. And interestingly, one of the things I noticed is when this person mentioned, uh, she mentioned that she was trying to learn some Tosa, she does not pronounce it as Tosa. She restricts it or she, um, who do what's it? Uh, reduces it, that's the word, uh, to a different click. So instead of saying posa with a lateral click, this person 
uses a click that's already in her inventory. She says, Kosa. And I found some of the same words by other speakers. So one of them is abbreviated as MB here. Um, that was the person who had a different inventory of clicks and uh, used the palatal click in one of these. So this kind of suggests that in this, in Chief Burgess's case, uh, the maybe the palate, the words that used to have palatal clicks have shifted to having dentals, which is a shift down the typological implication scale, right? From the, the more marked to the less marked. Okay, so um, what we're seeing is kind of her, her personal click system has sort of collapsed, but it's collapsed in a way that reveals something about, that's consistent with something about the phonology that we have evident from elsewhere in the typology. And I'm really excited about um, the same kind of thing showing up in uh, Afrikaans. This is um, work based on data collected by Camilla Christie and myself uh, related to Camilla Christie's PhD thesis, where she's looking at uh, this sort of history of language shift in Namakwa land. Ooh, sorry, I'm a bit over time, I think. Uh, let me just wrap up quickly. Uh, I'm almost done. Um, so Namakwa land is a, an area that, you know, it's named for the Nama who spoke Nama, uh, which is like related to Kwe Kwe. It's the same language as Kwe Kwe. So this is like, um, you know, they used to speak Nama here. Now people speak Afrikaans. So there's this process of language shift slash loss. And what's cool about this is that even though most people in Namakwa land don't really speak Nama anymore, um, and a lot of them are functionally monolingual Afrikaans speakers, they still use words with clicks. So it is common, for instance, to uh, have this word uh, either pronounced Tuni or Tuniki or Kuni. Um, and this is a borrowing from Nama. It's the word for elbow. Um, and sometimes people will put a, a diminutive suffix on the end. That's why you have that key at the end. But so basically here's a variety of Afrikaans that now has words with clicks. And what we can do is look at the individual inventories of the speakers who use these ones. It's quite variable, uh, Namakwa and Afrikaans, like which words an individual person knows and which ones words they use, uh, you know, varies a lot from person to person, but we can sort of look at each individual's use of clicks as like a little snapshot that might be analyzable in the same way as full languages are in the typology. And what's really interesting to me is that this gives us a new lens, right? This, you know, we can't exactly go and find more languages that have clicks, uh, but we can find these sort of finer grains of variation within that. Um, so out of the 18 speakers that Camilla has recorded, uh, what we found is that 15 of them produced at least some type of click with some kind of nasality. So that suggests that the, um, I've written it backwards, the oral clicks imply nasal clicks generalization still holds of these individual inventories that are the result of language attrition or language loss or language shift. Um, it's a little bit trickier to say whether the place scale holds in the same way. Um, it, seems like it does in some respects. So I've brought a couple of click inventories. Uh, this is one speaker's click tokens, like all, all of the different clicks that they produced in the recording we made um, fall into one of these four categories. Um, and what you can see with this person is, well, the most frequent type of click they use is nah, is nasal and dental is the least marked in this space of clicks, according to my hypothesis. Um, they also use other clicks. It's not really a contrast. Uh, so it's not clear how to interpret that as far as like, does the phonology allow these two segments? Does it recognize them as different versions of the same? Are they sort of allophones of one phoneme? Uh, those kinds of questions are harder to get at when we don't have contrast to rely on as a, a tool. Um, but so the point I want to make is, uh, even some of these super marginal click systems that are the result of generations of language shift 
uh, can still give us valuable information about the typology. So we do find some speakers who use nasal clicks all the time. We also tend to see like almost everybody produced nasal clicks. The ones that didn't uh, tended to be the ones that had very little data. Um, but there are places where like people's individual frequency of usage don't necessarily accord with what we would expect. So um, this inventory at the bottom, this is a different individual than the other inventory is, you know, a different person that we recorded um, and all of their clicks. They have four different types of clicks that they produce, uh, dental, lateral, alveolar, and palatal. And they do produce nasal clicks, but they aren't mostly producing nasal clicks, right? The, the frequency does not match up with the markedness scale, but the, the things that, the set of things that they produced, once we strip away that frequency data does accord with that. Okay. so. Um, what's cool about these particular cases is that they sort of give us a, a new lens to peer deeper at the empirical typology. Um, so what I've argued is that we have this sort of typology, uh, typological generalization. Um, if a language has uh, any clicks at all, then it has nasal ones. We can explain that by saying that the nasal clicks are pulmonic and that the pulmonic clicks are preferred over the non-pulmonic and that those sound nasal for basically for aerodynamic reasons. Uh, so if we represent this kind of airstream, uh, then we get a nice account of the typology. And it looks like we can also then sort of squint deeper at the typology and get a finer grade representation of it by looking at these sort of interspeaker variations in cases of language loss. And that's what marginal click inventories uh, can tell us that more robust click inventories can't. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yep. So do we have some uh, question? Uh, we don't have a lot of time, but uh, let's have a few questions. Uh, and it seems like Cedric has one, yeah. Yeah, yeah, one. Um, can you go back to slide 17, Will, please? Yes. <clears throat> Thanks. Well, uh, so we have a little chat with Senhun questioning if uh, the last line could correspond to adjectives. And uh, in any case, I think you need something in this line because otherwise it could be a, a little weird because I think we all agree that uh, plus pulmonic would be like the default case. And yeah. then if you do not have anything on the final line, it means that the only way to access to minus pulmonic will be by a language already activated uh, plus minus lingual will be mm. in the geometry yeah. of features. It will be very weird in a way. Like so. Yeah, um, that's a good point. I So I'm a two minds about ejectives. And I, I, there's sort of two lines of approach that I really like. One is, well, what if we represent them with a glottalic airstream feature? And I think I've sort of like these representations maybe presuppose that. So uh, the thinking is, well, maybe these aren't the only two airstream features. Maybe there's a third one that, uh, you know, is plus minus glottalic and plus glottalic are the ejectives. And maybe it's just, okay, the sounds that are completely you know minus airstream for all airstream features are the ones that are impossible um and so i i'm sort of envisioning that as more of a filter type of condition rather than a dependency type of condition um that said like people have gone a long way explaining the behavior of ejectives and implosives without needing a glottalic airstream feature um and like i'm reluctant to throw that away um I had some other thoughts uh, about ejectives. And one of the things, like I didn't get into detail about the um, phonetic implementation of the Airstream features that I'm, oops, sorry, let me jump ahead. Uh, so uh, what I sort of expect is that either there's gonna be a glottalic airstream or else there's some funny business going on with 
like the process of producing an ejective establishes a different set of cavities aerodynamically because you've got constriction between the, the larynx and the dorsum, say, or yeah. So good point, good question. Uh, I think there are ways to make this proposal reconcile with that, um, but I haven't settled on one yet. Thanks. Yeah. Anyone else having questions? Christina, do you, do you have some questions? No. Uh, sorry, no, I don't really have a question. I, um, but I was thinking that this is a really nice overview. So I hope if you are willing to record it, um, I mean, for South African students, I think it's a really great overview of Plex. They might lose some of the sort of finer questions and typologies maybe, but I think it's really nice to situate them in such a way for, for some of the teaching also that we do here. So um, I definitely really enjoyed listening to. Thanks. Any other questions? Maybe the, you mentioned this and I missed it, uh, but uh, I have a question. Maybe you mentioned it, but uh, yeah, the, the, the Kwakana speaker who has a reduced system, uh, uh, and I think, so if people reduce it, do you, uh, are you, basically your system predicts that the nasalized click or nasal clicks will be the ones that survive all the time or? Uh, is there uh, some other? So I, I think like so, some languages have contrasts between different kinds of nasal clicks. So like um, I happen to have a slide ready because I've been thinking about this. Um, so uh, Amanda Miller identified eight different attested ways in which a click can be paired with some kind of nasalization. Uh, I, you know, within that, I, I'm content to treat all of those as nasal, you know, from, from the sort of grain size I'm thinking of. Um, but like, I, I wouldn't expect all of them to be the default case, if that makes sense. So like, um, what I'm hoping is that uh, the nasal clicks of some variety will tend to be the, the ones that resist or that survive in cases of contraction. Um, but I don't, and that's like, and that follows from them being plus pulmonic, but I don't know if uh, I make a more specific pr prediction about like what kind of nasal clicks, like whether they should be voiced or voiceless, whether they should be glottalized. Lots and lots of languages have this sort of affinity between glottalization and nasality in clicks. So like Nama famously, one of the sets of clicks is called delayed aspirated. And they were called that initially because it seemed like that's what they are. Uh, but then they're always phonetically nasalized. And I think what's going on there is that uh, there's some sort of maybe a, a pairing of like the glottis is being used as a second gesture along with nasal venting to implement pulmonicity, right? It's, it's like, well, you have less airflow, you need to vent if you restrict the air going out of the lungs in the first place. Um, yeah. So I think that there's probably a rich space of like finer grained distinctions once we have the, the basic architecture. Um, yeah. Oh. Okay, great. Uh, does anyone else have a question? Uh, maybe you can still think about it, and uh, Will will be around. Uh, definitely. Yeah, I'm gonna stick around. So if you have any question, you can ask uh, afterwards. Uh, so let's thank Will one more time. Uh, thank you, uh, and let's stop the recording.